Okay, good morning and welcome to New World Medals, Perth edition. And that song, September, what a great month. Everyone getting excited. There's a couple of little things happening this month. Obviously, there's the AFL, the AFL finals. It's a pretty big deal. But there's one thing that's also happening in September that's even bigger deal for us at Vertical Events, and it's the New World Medals September Roadshow. So those of you that are here today, this is the Perth leg kicking off on the 8th of September here. And do we have any Dockers supporters out there? Yeah, got some Dockers supporters as well. All things going well. If the Dockers can get over Collingwood on Saturday night, you could almost jump on the roadshow with us because you can come over and watch them hopefully beat Sydney at the SCG on that next Saturday and then come down to the Fullerton Hotel in Martin Place, Sydney, and see a whole nother and some of the companies that are presenting here today, but a whole group of other companies involved in the New World Medals, Future Medals Facing Commodity Division. And then track down to Melbourne for the 22nd of September at the Grand Hyatt. Come to our show there in Melbourne and hang around for Saturday and the AFL Grand Final and hopefully Fremantle's first ever premiership. So that would be that would be a really great outcome for the month of September. But we're here today in Perth, so it's time to start acknowledging some of the sponsors. And first of Definitely number one for us is Argonaut and Eddie's ready to go, which is great. Um, I've just got to get through this a little bit quicker because he's got a lot to say and we're all very excited to hear about the, uh, the future opportunities that exist in the capital market for New World Metals companies. The CRU team's here and for those of you who hopefully will be able to hang around for the whole day, I'm really looking forward to their presentation as they close out the day, talking about the demand and the whole metrics around this very exciting stage for those companies involved in these commodities. The Lynn partners, great supporters. Jeff can't be here because he's in New York, but we look forward to one day bringing him up on the stage. And they've been uh, sponsoring vertical events and all our conferences since about 2013. We really appreciate their support. Cooper partners are back. There's Rachel on the front cover of the coffee cup. So make sure you get down. They're sponsoring our coffee, which is great to have them back. And uh, yeah, go and introduce yourselves to them and great people. So we thank them for their support. And then there's all the media partners associated with today's event. So you'll, I'm sure you'll see Wally Graham wandering around from the Resources Roadhouse and Dave Tasker. And so without any further ado, I'll pass it on to Chrissy. She'll do the uh, welcome to country. And we look forward to listening to Eddie and also all our great presenters over the next day. Thanks. Thanks so much. I don't actually have to do the welcome to country because it's written up there behind me. So we'll take that to heart even as we get going. Hey, those cups from um, Cooper Partners, when you do go up and grab your cup of coffee this morning, grab your chocolate as well. I hope you've got your popcorn for the main event with Eddie right now. We'll sit down and listen to that one. They've got a $1,000 bottle of Grange there, $2,012, $1,000 bottle of Grange. So make sure you put your business card in there as well. And talking about uh, Dockers Tragics, uh, Jackson, there's one here who happens to hang out at one of the stands, uh, one of our exhibitors. So go and have a chat with the guys at European Medals, meet Peter. You'll see he's got a nice purple tie. Ask him what colour his, his car is and his jocks at the same time because apparently he's got a heck of a lot of purple in his life and he's looking forward to this game this weekend. We're looking forward to having a chat with you today. We've got 29 presentations to get through, so there is a lot. I am going to be very brutal with my timing. I'm going to be ringing my bell at three minutes. I'm going to be giving my presenters their three-minute warning and I'll be giving them the two-minute warning and I'll be standing up at one. And as I remember, as Shane is pointing out, there are no steps on that side of the stage, so I may just push you to the side. I'm not going to do anything else right now except welcome up our one and only Eddie. Uh, Jackson's introduced him already. He's got a lot to say. He's actually been given 20 minutes this morning. So much does he have to say, but Eddie, you still remain my crush test dummy. So at three minutes, I'm going to ring my bell. Would you please make him welcome to get us all started today? Uh, thanks, uh, Chrissy, and also thanks to RIU, to Stewie and uh, Jackson. Um, the topic of my discussion today is uh, talking about the timing for New Age Medals, but also to provide some context around that um, and hopefully sort of keep it real, 
give you some thoughts as to what we're witnessing. Uh, is it real? Is it sustainable? Or is it transitory? Yeah, you know, it's a strange world out there, and I'm always confused by things. This morning I got up, I went to the cupboard, I grabbed his shirt, and it had his slim fit, and it fitted me. It's a strange world. Um, one thing I do ask, just with some presenters out there, company presenters, don't focus too much on supply and demand and the commodity which you identify with. Uh, that's really the job of CRU, CRU and also uh, for Argonaut to talk about. And just also another handy hint, when you do come in to talk to a broking firm, don't focus too much on that. We really don't want to hear your views on it unless you're an industry, real genuine industry expert. And we normally get people like that to come in and present to us in any event. So um, it's because we just want to hear about your project and your people. Um, so let me jump into this. So um, people have seen the different you know, minerals which make up in new age well, uh, metals. And, it's, and we all know this is about that these minerals are critical for the transition to batteries, solar, electric vehicles, wind, et cetera. Um, and each of these different metals are starting from a different sort of base. And we know copper is already a very mainstream metal, but you know, critical to the energy transition. Um, and the, the purpose of these is to, you know, supposedly, and I'll talk about this a bit later, is, is to make the world a better place, the environment, to reduce our carbon footprint, and it's a transition to clean energy. Um, there's still old world metals like iron ore, particularly magnetite and aluminium, which will play a tremendous role in the energy transition as the, the style of energy delivery is very much infrastructure rich as it is now, which is you know, with hydrocarbons and coals, where you actually burn it to create the energy. Um, do make another comment just to understand and put, putting things in context. The production value of coal produced today is 10 times the value of all those uh, metals there. So it just gives you a bit of a context. Um, that's likely to cross over before 2040, but just gives you a bit of a feel for this little bit of context. I always like looking at this slide to see, you know, we keep talking about, you know, it's about energy transition and, and you know, your battery metals. But when you have a look at what's happened in the last 12 months, uh, it's really been about Ukraine, right? Um, we've seen the old world coal completely spike, natural gas, crude oil. The only new age metal to really perform this calendar year uh, is lithium. Um, and that continues to go uh, from strength to strength. We go back last year and we're all cock a hoot. And we're talking about what happened last year. We saw lithium and cobalt, neodymium, um, graphite, vanadium, all going great. But this year it's really about the old world. And that's about energy security because people don't want to go cold. People want to have lights. Um, and it demonstrated to everyone about the importance of energy security, which we'll talk about today in supply chain, particularly when it comes to rare earths. Um, this is always a great slide to look at, you know, who's performed really well. And this leads on to my, my, uh, my theoretical $10,000 investment. Um, and what it shows you here is that once again, reflecting what I said there on the previous slide on commodities, the best performing companies are all old world pretty much, other than some lithium companies. So that's always interesting. The other point I point out here is that the resource space has been pretty average. It's a 4% increase this year. So it hasn't been a great space to be in. Next slide is I, I do this and I, I do it wherever I go. I try and work out what I do if I invest $10,000 evenly um, across either the small resources index, uh, which would be pretty boring to do, um, $10,000 spread evenly across every company presenting here today, $10,000 in the commodities which they identify with, or $10,000 across the old world commodities. And what it shows me today, if I invest in all your companies, I barely pay for lunch. So, um, but last year it was great, um, given that uh, $10,000 was worth by the by September $17,000. This year, $10,000 is worth $10,767. So, and I do like a long lunch. And I am having lunch with Stewie's place tomorrow at Squires Loft, if anyone's heading down there. That's good take, good steak down there. I am generally having lunch down there. Um, 
So just setting the scene, and, and, and this slide here, I think people see this slide, and these are consensus numbers, and, and whether these are the Paris Agreement numbers or the uh, IEA's uh, sustainable development scenario. But these are the consensus numbers provided by Wood McKenzie. Um, and you'll see the, the source at the bottom of the slides here. This is stuff made up by uh, genuine experts. And what I like to look at this is about keeping it in context, and, and what it says that if you use today's commodity price, by 2050, the copper market will be worth about $500 billion. But if you use today's lithium carbonate price, and that's the price we use for uh, determining the market for lithium, the lithium market by 2050 will be $459 billion. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. Having a lithium market, which is a small part of the energy transition market, nothing like copper, and copper has all these other uses, to lithium to be the similar size to copper. So what that tells us, and our view internally is that the copper market should be at least three times the lithium market, if at least three times. So that sort of tells us either the copper price has got to go up, which I think I'm a fan of, or the lithium price has got to come down, which I also think is most probably a bit likely. Um, we also talk about nickel there. Nickel's up, in a, in nickel would be a $193 billion industry and rare earths about $72 billion. So that just gives you a bit of a feel for those different sectors. But you know, they're coming off different bases given rare earths are so small and, and lithium so small. So hence why you expect the human aggregate growth rate to be where it's at. Um, I think we all understand the metal intensity going into uh, energy delivery in the new age is very, very different. Um, you know, we're seeing situations where, you know, you know, there's there's nine times more minerals required to do a wind farm than it is to do the equivalent gas-fired power station. Um, but you know, just in cars, it's a really simple one. Cars, you know, you're gonna have to use 3.8 times more copper in a car. Um, than you used in an internal combustion engine car. And that leads to a five time increase in copper demand for EVs alone, just but for that EV component this decade. On the raw materials, and I mentioned uh, security of demand and, 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 and supply chain security and diversity. There's a real warning here, and it's something which you see leading company, countries like the US and in Europe are very concerned that the concentration of these energy transition minerals is much more concentrated than oil and gas is. Now, people always worry about oil and gas concentration, but it's nothing like what these energy transition. Um, the rare earths is absolutely dominated by China. Lithium is dominated by Australia. Cobalt's dominated by the DRC, and nickel increasingly dominated by Indonesia. When it comes to processing, China is in excess of 50% for cobalt, rare earths, and lithium. And when it comes to rare earths, it's, you know, it's close to 90%. And we can't have uh, electric vehicles without permanent magnets. And you can't have permanent magnets without rare earths. So we all um, have a challenge ahead of us. Um, just this one here, and, and this is always a quandary I have. We make changes because some people feel good about some changes, right? They do studies, but maybe not always do they consider what the implications are. So what we do know, the electric car uses six times the intensity of minerals as an internal combustion engine vehicle. So there's three times more copper, 3.8 times. There's nine times more lithium, 40 times more nickel, two times more manganese, 13 times more cobalt, 66 times more graphite. And as I mentioned, for wind farms, there's nine times. That's onshore, offshore, it's even more. You know, the question you gotta ask yourself, is all this really worth the reduction in the carbon footprint? We don't know that answer um, and we'll know it 2050, but I'm pretty much, I'm certain we are gonna damage the environment by chasing all these minerals. But it's good for WA and it's good for Argonne because that's what we do, fund these sort of things. So, I mean, it's all context, right? Um, it's just keeping it real. Um, this is an interesting slide. And I talk about lithium because lithium has been the outperformer of all the different uh, new age commodities. And this slide here shows you this funny color. I think I could, if I got a laser on this thing, maybe, maybe I don't have a laser anymore. Um, but that funny color over on the left hand side, that's the mark, that's the companies listed on the Chinese stock exchanges. The light blue is the ASX, the green is US, 
that funny, I don't know what colour is this, brownie or reddy, I don't know, earthy colour. That's Canada. And that tiny little thing down the bottom, that dark blue, that's for old AIM. And that's really only, I mean, it's only a matter of time before AIM disappears as a resources exchange. On the right-hand side, it talks about the size of the lithium market. And what's interesting about it is that at $90,000 lithium carbonate price, the whole industry is $54 billion. So for 2022, so the whole industry, everything, everything is, is $54 billion. The mark cap of those companies is 142. But then when you take into account the diversified companies down the bottom there, like West Farmers now, um, Independence, uh, Rio Min, um, and you say Min's most really, most of their market caps now lithium focus. We expect there's another 35 to 40 billion dollars down there attributable value. So we've got a, a sector listed sector attributable value of of something like 180 billion dollars, um, 90 thousand dollars carbonate price most probably not sustainable. Um, just call 60. Um, even 40 bucks long term, 40,000 bucks long term. So it's six times, the market caps are six times the total addressable market today. So that tells me that the addressable market is going to grow pretty rapidly. The market is forward facing. So the left hand side is forward facing. And um, you'd think, given that's the addressable market, not the profit, um, you'd expect that uh, that addressable market is going to grow. And that's what all the experts are suggesting. I love this slide. This is my Goldman Sachs slide. So back in 2018, we had our last lithium, a bit of a mini lithium boom. The combined market caps of those companies I mentioned before on ASX alone reached $8 billion. And you can see the lithium carbonate price there. And just for everyone's edification, lithium carbonate is 19% lithium metal. Um, that black line there reflects it. You see the massive jump up there. You see there in April, late April, when Goldman Sachs said the dance was over. Um, you saw com the, the combined market cap go from $48 billion down to $30 billion, um, but the lithium carbonate price didn't come down. And it's actually higher now than when uh, Goldman said the, the game was over. So that's great. Uh, and we've seen commodity price or the stock prices rapidly bounce back again from uh, down $30 billion back to $42 billion and growing every day. Um, great slide, but you, know, you do see a rise like this. You don't think it's really long-term um, sustainable. Um, Pilbara Minerals, great story, great story. Um, last year I spoke here and I said um, they've just finished a year where they had a market cap of $6 billion. So a year ago, $6 billion, and they had $51 million loss for that year. They just announced their results, and uh, the, today their market cap's $11 billion, and they made a profit of $563 million in FY22. But the most, uh, uh, most amazing point was that for the June quarter, they increased their cash balance by $589 million. I got that right? Yeah, $589 million in the June quarter alone. The cash billed $589 million, nearly $600 million. To put that in context, that was more than the cash build of every gold producer on ASX up and to including Northern Star. I mean, i just say that again. One company, one leasing company, the market cap of 10, or at that point in time, it had about six, uh, $8 billion market cap, $11 billion market cap, generated more cash in one quarter than every gold producer on ASX. And there's more gold producers on ASX than any other exchange in the world, up to and including Northern Star. So it excludes Newcrest, but that's a hell of a lot of companies. If you combine the market caps of those companies, it's a very big number. Um, this, you can't talk about any transition without copper. Um, and in copper, whenever you mention the word recession, uh, the stock goes down. So they call it Dr. Copper because it reflects the health of the global economy. Um, but I think people are forgetting the role it has in energy transition. Um, you know, we talked about the, the use of copper and EVs. We know by 2025, the amount of copper going into battery uh, EV cars will exceed the copper in internal combustion engines. We also know that copper plays not just in electric vehicles, but in, in solar farms, in off, onshore and offshore uh, wind farms, the amount of copper required. And of course, you need to actually transmit that power to people's homes, and that's copper again. Nickel's an interesting one, and, and I, I'm certain the world's getting nickel wrong. Um, this is one thing I'd, I'm very comfortable on, that nickel's a great space to be, and we've got some really good nickel companies running out of this town. 
Um, nickel has always been regarded as a prosperity metal. I, it's for stainless steel. It's when you're going well and everyone's flash and they spend a lot of money because it's a high-priced metal, uh, high-priced coating for steel. Um, we'll mostly see if it gets too high, they'll be sort of swapping out in substitution into zinc. But we've seen this drop off this year um, and a particularly strong drop off since this squeeze. Um, and we just think that's not right because the role which they're going to play in EVs is and batteries is tremendous. So what we're seeing there that the amount of it, uh, nickel used in batteries is going to increase 500% this year, uh, this decade. Um, and then in the longer term, for this over this period, the amount of nickel used consumed increases by 50% in total. So taking into account the industrial purposes of stainless steel rolls, the total still goes up by 50%, and developing nickel mines isn't the easiest job. So we think that the role they're playing in EVs is being misunderstood. And this is what happens with you know, 50 years of you know, experience. Everyone goes copper, recession, ne negative, recession, nickel down but their role is changing with energy transition. A lot of people would say that, you know, the great things which happened to, to the, the global economies has been the industrial revolution and then the urbanization of China or the rebuild of Japan after the wars and Germany. And then you've got the, the urbanization of China. There's a lot of people would say to you that the energy transition will be bigger than the urbanization of China. And if that's the case, you know, it's great for us. Um, you can't talk about, energy transition without talking about rare earths and there's a rare in there. Um, I can't sing. Um, the guys in the office wanted me to sing the play school song, but not able to do that. Um, tone deaf. But what I was sort of say to you is that I don't, this is really complicated and uh, we're pleasure that we've actually had Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Dudley Kings North come in and sort of talk to us about what it all means. Um, but what I can say is I can focus on those, um, the 17 metals which cut, which are in the rare earth family and they come from the the different minerals that are on the right and i do note on the minerals on the right most of it comes from monzonite outside of china and in china it's mainly comes from the clays um, but there's four different um there's two lights which are in every permanent battery a uh, permanent magnet and then you've got tibibian and deprosium are uh, also added to it in the heavies which are used to ensure that when there's, there's major change in temperature that the, the magnets still perform at the right level of integrity those four um, uh, elements or metals, sorry, those four metals are all in deficit today. They account for 30% of volumes of rare earths, but they account for over 90% of value. Um, so you can see those space are really great space to be in. Um, rare earths, um, it's a funny thing. I mean, every other day we're getting companies presenting to us about rare earths. Um, one thing I do say about rare earths, they're, uh, they're rare, but not necessarily well done. And, and what we talk about there is that other than China, China's got a 50 year dominance and they've done an amazing job, China. They protect that IP. Nowhere else in the world is there a integrated supply chain. I want to talk, I'll jump to this slide here because this sort of explains it. The last time there was a, a boom in the rare earth space, there was just on 10, $15 billion raised for the 60 companies which identified as rare earth companies just over 10 billion was actually spent on those projects. They had a combined number of 200 projects. Out of that, we got one mine. So um, every, every ore body is different. And so every process route is project specific. Um, it's really, really challenging, Raris. Um, the mark caps of the company in the space now, and I, I could put some slides about that, have grown dramatically, but I do caution the investing community that it's pretty challenging. Last time we got one mine. And just on that one mine, Mount Weld, it took from 1990 when they first invested in it to 1919, so 2019 before it was cash flow positive. And when they commissioned it in 2012, it took seven years from commissioning to make cash. Pretty amazing, challenging game. Um, great to see we're doing some downstream processing and, and MinRes leading the charge there and saying now they're going to move towards battery manufacturing. We do think that the commodity cycle is going to be longer um, because of those reasons there. Um, I, I just think now nationalisation assets are a big thing outside of uh, a few key jurisdictions. The approval process is very slow. A lot of ore bodies are challenging to find, albeit rare earths don't apparently be seen to be because everyone seems to be announcing a new one. Um, and I'd just like to finish 
with some thoughts on the guys at Argonaut. We're, you know, we're our 20 year anniversary this year. Um, we got, we focus and stay remain very focused on being technical. We've got seven different technical people on the team, five geos, metallurgist and a engineer, mining engineer, um, which makes sure that we try and avoid doing um, deals we shouldn't do. Um, We've got, we are local, but we do have a global. We've gone and got our North American license. We've had the office in Asia for 10 years. Um, and just want to mention the David Franklin and the Argonaut Natural Resources Fund. 44% um, return last year, 125% over two years. Number one rated um, Australian Equity Alternative Fund. And number two fund rated uh, all Australia. So Australian Fund Monitors, which is an independent body, rates 700 funds and it was the number two performing fund in Australia last year. And over the two years is actually the number one performing fund. So if you want to make some money in resources, talk to Dave Franklin. Um, thank you for listening to us. And hopefully um, I've um, created something for you to think about. Thanks. I'm just, oh, it is on. I'm just um, checking my battery here. I was going to come over and have a chat with you. I thought you actually beat me. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's What was the last bit you said, though? Because I was distracted. I was watching my time to see how perfect you were. If you want to make some money in resources, you invest in? David Franklin's Argonaut Natural Resources Fund. There we go. Oh, got it. Okay. Is that the one we talked about the other day? He came in here. Actually, he was good. He was talking about Coopers and those ones. All right. That was a bit inspirational, wasn't it? I was trying to type things madly as he was talking, as you may have seen. But the good news is that you can actually go back and recap on that. Jackson was just going to get that information to me as to where you can do it. You can go onto the PIC on the YouTube channel. Just let me double check because Vertical Events, we've got a new uh, website up as well and we've got a YouTube channel there too. So in the future, um, we'll be putting up all of our um, talks as we go, our presentations. But at the moment, um, on the PIC YouTube. So I'd like to see that one. I'll be putting that one out to others as well. All right. Let's get underway. 29 presentations. As Eddie just said, he wants to hear about your project and your people. That's what's important to him. Um, and you don't have to sing because Eddie didn't have to sing as he presented. I was interested too about your slim fit, your slim fit shirt. I was impressed. And obviously, you're, you did you make smaller investments in those companies? Did you? Is that, is that why the slim fit shirt is fitting? Yeah? Nothing there. So Stewie's investing in everything. He's got, yeah, so he's, he's got lunch is actually on Stewie today for all of us. All right. Our first presentation today is from a group that's poised to capitalize on the North American battery manufacturing industry. Green Technology Metals is building their preeminently vertically integrated lithium business in Ontario, Canada. And to talk to us, the man, Eddie, that's known as the human dynamo over uh, with this group, would you please welcome Cameron Henry, who is the non-executive director of the company. Please put your hands together. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Chrissy, and uh, great to be opening the New World Battery Metals, or Metals Conference today. Um, just for everyone in the room, I'm, an, I'm a ring-in. I um, am here at the last moment, so we uh, only got the, uh, the call up last week. I'm a non-executive director and uh, most of my team's in Canada at the moment. But in keeping with Eddie's theme, I think today we'll be talking about three things, which will be uh, the team, the projects and the, lo the location. So I'll jump into it. So Green, Techno uh, green Technology Metals, uh, we've only been listed for uh, just, uh, just under 12 months now in the ASX. Uh, and our, our core strategy, investment strategy is to define, partner, unlock um, lithium uh, projects in, in North America and specifically uh, in Canada. Uh, the corporate snapshot, um, market cap of just under about uh, 180 million, uh, 250 million shares on issue. Uh, we're well funded, cash at bank for around about 65 million, uh, June 30. Uh, we are very undervalued in our in our um, view. And I guess uh, with an EV of only about 110 million compared to some of our peers, uh, we certainly think we're uh, very attractive and, and, and provide a good valuation uh, prospect on the ASX. Uh, the share register, we're pretty tightly held by board and management uh, and our larger partners, which I'll talk about through the presentation. Um, our joint venture partner as well, who owns 20% of the projects uh, and uh, the rest is, is made up from uh, the retail sector and, sector and some funds. As you can see here, uh, Ontario, we are very well focused and very well positioned for uh, the North American battery mineral thematic. 
uh, our projects are in uh, Western Ontario, close to infrastructure, and that's probably what I'll talk about a bit today as well. Um, in our view, there's 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 uh, a lot of really good mineral endowment through the uh, northern parts of Canada. A lot of them are really big deposits. A lot of them are horrendously stranded. And I think our investment strategy and I guess our operational strategy is to bring um, assets that are closer to the infrastructure into production earlier. Uh, so focusing on the team, um, John Young, um, probably, probably doesn't need too much of an introduction to most of the people in the room. John's uh, our chairman and was uh, one of the founding uh, partners of, of uh, Pilbara Minerals, one of the best performing lithium businesses in the world currently. Uh, myself, uh, not executive director, I'm actually the founder and, and my day job is actually managing director of Primera Group. So we're an engineering construction group. And we'll also talk about a bit, bit, bit more about our partnership and our relationship with uh, green technology through the, through the presentation. Uh, Pat Murphy, uh, some people may know Pat in this room. He's, uh, he's actually born and bred from Western Australia, but resides in Sydney now. He's the managing director of AMCI, which is a, a global resources fund and probably uh, has some of the biggest and best investments in Australia in the iron ore and coal sector and is now moving to the battery mineral side. Uh, and Rob Longley, who's uh, not exec executive director and is actually the managing director of Arden, uh, who we acquired the assets off uh, in 2021. Uh, so back of the team, uh, Luke Cox, he's he's up there at the moment. He's uh, walking the ground and and um, walk, working with our team in Canada. Uh, Luke's got a pretty extensive experience in mining, sort of 30 years. Well, maybe not that, maybe not that old. He looks older than he is. Um, but certainly a lot of pedigree in uh, in the lithium space and multiple other commodities. Uh, he was actually a mine manager up at Wajina for quite some time for mineral resources. So he understands how to mine pegmatites and how to build a team. Uh, Matt Herbert, our general manager in North America, he's based in Thunder Bay, XFMG, 20 years experience. Uh, Andrea Johnson, she's also XFMG and she's working on all our permitting in the ESG. Um, uh, Nathan Th Sims, our exploration manager, who's a, he's a local from Thunder Bay up there in Ontario, and John Winterbottom, who's also walking around today, who's our technical, technical services manager. So very strong team. Um, and I think as uh, Eddie sort of focused on, we're not going to talk about, I guess, the, the thematic, he's done that enough today, but there's one thing in this lithium space, there's been a lot of money that's been invested and there's a lot of projects that probably haven't really progressed over the last sort of five or six years. Um, we think that we've put together a really good team and it's about getting into production and that's what we're focused on. So our strategy here, um, ABC, pretty simple, but um, always harder in reality. Uh, resource advancements. So we've we've started, we've, we've commenced uh, drilling at Seymour as soon as we listed 12 months ago. We've doubled the resource there, there over the last 12 months up to about 10 million tonnes, we're continuing to, to, to drill there. But I guess the, the, the names underneath that are all our other projects. So we are looking at building a vertically integrated supply chain in Ontario. Um, it's a very attractive um, uh, location. There is plenty of infrastructure. There's plenty of interest. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mining community. So we think that uh, not only will we get Seymour into production over the coming years, there's probably two or three of those others, maybe four of those other projects there underneath that we will get into production. So spodge being concentrate, and uh, that's the first stage of lithium uh, production. We'll get uh, some of these mines into production. We'll, we'll, we'll build at least one or even two in an eastern and western hub uh, scenario, which are close to our projects, which will uh, produce the spodge being concentrate in various, various methods. Um, and that's where Primero Group, will, which I will talk about, also comes into, into its own. Uh, and then the eventual uh, trans, transition into a lithium hydroxide producer. So um, chemicals is where you need to be. Um, producing just a, a concentrate, yes, it's great for, for certain points and inflections in the market when you can capitalise on high prices. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a chemicals business and uh, that's where we'll be. Uh, so first, so first step in the strategy is to define the, the uh, define the critical mass resource. Um, up to 10 million tons already at Seymour. We're continuing to drill. Uh, grades come off a little bit from our original uh, resource, just as we're looking at the extents of the first North Albury pegmatite. Uh, so we're down just over one percent, but we think that that will uh, increase as we continue. Uh, Forty-one thousand hectares. We've got uh, arguably the, the largest um, land holding with lithium bearing ground in Ontario. Um, We've certainly, I think when we when we listed, we had uh, probably about a quarter of that. We've added about 30, 35,000 hectares over the last uh, nine months. Uh, a lot of unpegged ground up there and our, our exploration team's done a great job in, in uh, increasing those that land holding. Uh, exploration targets, 50 to 60 million tonnes. That's only across our first three projects. 
uh, we'll certainly be adding to that um, exploration target over the year. Uh, and we have four key areas, Seymour, Root, uh, Weaster and Allison project areas. Uh, second part of our, of our strategy is to partner with great companies, um, you know, to accelerate the time frame of developing projects and, you know, in the junior space and getting into, you know, building, a, I guess, a, a lithium business is you need to partner with the right people. Uh, we're very aware that we're down here in Perth and we founded the company from Perth and we do a lot of work and, and our, our Primero group, who is, is all part of, also part of this, has the tech, Technical Excellence Centre here in Perth in processing lithium. But uh, we realised pretty quickly that we had to uh, get some good partners on board. So you see on the, on the, on the bottom there, we've got uh, good partners in our, in our First Nations, which is White Sound First Nation Group. Uh, Ontario government, we're doing a lot of work with them. We need uh, government back, backing to obviously get the, um, the authority to operate and license to uh, permit to license to, to mine. Uh, Lithium Americas, um, in our last capital raise in, in February, we bought on Lithium Americas, which is basically $4 billion dollar. Uh, lithium uh, business based out of the US and North America. They also have assets in South America, just about to bring their brine assets into, into production. So I'd say they're probably about the fourth fourth or fifth largest lithium, lithium business in the world at the moment. Uh, very supportive of the Hard Rock um, thematic with us as well. Um, they understand they have large clay projects and brine projects, but uh, they also think that Hard Rock is the future in lithium, which uh, we're, we're a strong advocate for. And as I mentioned a couple of times, Primary Group, but also AMCI. Uh, unlock the full potential. Um, we're looking at produce at upstream mineral extraction. We're looking at producing uh, midstream chemical uh, for the downstream industry up in uh, Ontario and Quebec. For everyone that watches the lithium space, and I guess some of the announcements that have been made over the last 12 months, I mean, there is billions and billions being spent in Quebec and Ontario on not only precursor and cathode material um, production, but then also there is investment in, in, in uh, EV production in Ontario. And of course, there's huge amounts of investment going to the US now. Uh, and I'll talk about one really important acronym in a few slides time, but that's the IRA. And uh, for those who don't know anything about the IRA, I've, I've got a slide on it, but uh, that's been the biggest change we've seen in the North American market and probably the lithium space in the last two years at least. So this is just, uh, I guess, our four-staged development uh, strategy. So leveraging our partnerships. So Primero Group, who I'm the managing director of, are a 6.4% shareholder and probably looking to increase potentially. Um, look, we've been in lithium since 2015, and you'll see some of the clients we've worked for there. We're, we're currently working with most of the clients on that, on that slide um, in various natures, building and operating lithium processing facilities, not only here in Western Australia, but also in North America, particularly the US and Canada. Um, you know, we've got a, a team of about 1,300 people at the moment. We've got a process team of about 25 people with some of the best and leading minds in the industry, which uh, look at not only uh, developing lithium concentrates, but also downstream chemicals as well. Uh, lithium Americas, I did speak a little about them and uh, you know, I can't bang on enough about them. They're, they're a really great uh, partner. Uh, we're conversing almost sort of fortnightly at the moment on strategic um, development of not only our technical skills, but also learning more about their technical skills. Uh, they've got a lot of good uh, um, ideas and I guess investment strategies within the North American market as well. Uh, and they're certainly a, a world leader in developing uh, their, their Nevada uh, assets in the clay in the clay sector as well. So great, great having them on board as a partner. And AMCI is a 9.9% .9 shareholder. Um, yeah, they, they're they're really large here in, in iron ore in Western Australia and uh, coal on the east coast. But you know, a company that uh, probably to about three and a half billion in assets. They they effectively effectively act as a private equity group, but uh, they're also basically an operator of multiple apps, assets globally. Uh, so Seymour, this is our flagship project that we've just uh, we've commenced drilling on. You can sort of see a bit more of a regional map there. We've got Seymour, which is probably more to the right hand side, and then we've got our Western Hub as well. So we call it the Eastern and the Western Hub. Um, it's about 10 million tonnes at the moment. Uh, we're continuing to drill there. We've still got an exploration target of 20 to 26 million tonnes. Uh, we're looking for a resource upgrade uh, around about Christmas time or into Q1 next year. Uh, we just commenced drilling at the Root Hub, which is more of the Western Hub as well. Uh, so the Root Project on the Western Hub, which is more to the left-hand side. Um, I won't go too far into the actual geology and, and uh, I guess, the, the resource itself on mechanicals. So geology is probably not my strong point. But uh, you can see it's a pretty sort of uh, uh, steeply dipping pegmatite, around about 65 degrees. Uh, it looks very – it's got a really high core, thick um, 
um, middle, which is you know up to about 1.4, 1.5 percent lithium. So it's a it's a great sort of starter project for us, and we will be getting to that into production in 2025, as we'll show on the slides. Uh, field activities are really picking up there. There's a lot of uh, ge geophysical interpretation uh, and some really good uh, targets that we're generating in the area. So there's a lot of uh, greenfields exploration going on there at Seymour. Root, as I said, we just started drilling on. So uh, I think we, we've been drilling for three days now and uh, looking at already intercepting an, an historical resource that's there. Uh, we're looking to build on that over the, over the coming months as well. And, and uh, we'll have our first resource at Root in Q1 next year. Permitting, we're well advanced in permitting. Uh, we're into the second year of our baseline studies. There's three year uh, requirements, same here as Western Australia. We've got a full team on site up there and moving really quickly through our, through our environmental permitting, which is a huge uh, hurdle into production. Uh, Ontario, great place to operate. It's, it's a huge, huge place, uh, I think, for the, for the minerals uh, sector over the next sort of three to five, even 10 years and potentially beyond. And lithium certainly is, there's a lot of well-endowed well lithium projects in the area. Uh, green energy, one of the biggest advantages we have over a lot of our competitors, and I guess, our, unfortunately, our competitors down in Western Australia is we've got green energy in Ontario. We've got hydropower. So you will see recently that Mercedes and, um, and VW have, have struck up an MOU with the Canadian government. Uh, and I believe, you know, personally, that's because uh, the European thematic on the ESG scenario on, on, on sourcing green, green material, green earth materials from places like Ontario is, is going to be really the place to be. A minute, I'm pushing through. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, infrastructure. We're very close to rail sidings and uh, well located close to the US. This is the bit I was talking about, the IRA, the Infl In Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this is, a, 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 I guess, it's the government um, initiative that's been brought in, which creates uh, a, a tax incentive for any um, electric vehicles that are purchased in the US where their critical minerals have been sourced from US trading partners and in specific closest one, which is which is Canada. So we're in a really good position and uh, we're certainly going to benefit from that over the coming years. Seymour, we're working on the PEA, which will be out uh, in Q1 next year. That'll be our first economic assessment of the project. It will be integrated with upstream and downstream. So that's a lot of work going on there. Uh, infrastructure, we've got airports, we've got uh, roads, all road weather access, we've got rail. Um, we, can, we can move product east, west, north, south, through Canada and into the US and uh, obviously power lines as well, very close to hydropower. Uh, this is the development timeline. Uh, first, phosphorus production by 2025, second half of 25, and we're targeting hydroxide production in 2027. And we're about to get kicked off stage. And that's our long-term vision, which is building Eastern and Western hubs and uh, conversion into the future. That's it, thank you very much. Well done. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Well done, Cameron, and you can go outside and ask him questions and the rest of the team as well. For a last minute call up, you did a bloody good job, even not knowing the, the geo background. You're obviously a very close knit team out there. So thanks. Now, as Eddie showed us on that slide uh, earlier on this morning, uh, in the top 10 performers, the only new world medals to take it into that top 10 list is lithium. So Eight of our 29 presentations today, Eddie, are actually people that are working in this particular space. And our second presenter today is one of them. They weren't part of RIU New World Metals in 2021, but that's because they've only been opera in operation for less than a year. Um, Red Dirt Metals focused on developing the recently discovered Mount Ida lithium deposit here in WA. They completed in excess of 60,000 metres of drilling since discovery in September last year. They're advancing very rapidly. This fellow here is Matthew Boys. He's here to present his very first presentation with us at RIU, hopefully the first of many, and uh, talking about the exciting journey from lithium uh, discoverer to lithium developer. Please make him very welcome. Uh, thank you, Christian. And can everyone hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Christian. And thank you, uh, delegates, for being present today. It looks like a really good turnout. Uh, thanks, Eddie, for the intro as well. Um, Red Dirt Metals, uh, Unlocking a Green Future. We started uh, with the Mount Ida project in late uh, 2021. So we've been on the, we've been on the, uh, on the, basically on, on the, in the lithium market for less than a year. Mount Ida represents what we think is a new lithium province. It's never previously been 
uh, explored for lithium in any way, shape or form. When we bought the project, we actually bought it as a gold asset uh, and then discovered that we had a, an excellent lithium, lithium resource on the project. Uh, one of the great aspects about Mount Ida is uh, people have touched on this before, is, is the uh, advancement and the ease of, of permitting. Mount Ida itself is actually located on two, uh, it's actually kind of more than two, but mining, granted mining leases in Western Australia. One thing we can't emphasise enough is how important that is and how, how that will facilitate Mount Ida to come into production as quickly as physically possible. We have heritage, heritage approval in place. We have a considerable advantage with that in reducing our time frame to getting this asset into development. Our maiden resource estimate, as Christy touched on before, is due out in Q4 this year. So really, we're just around the corner. We've put in over 60,000 metres of drilling into the asset since we picked it up in late 2021. We raised over $30 million in the last 12 months. And we put, 60, uh, yeah, put, we're going to put another 40,000 metres into the asset before the end of the year. Red Dirt is focusing on delivering accelerated path to market. It's critical to maximise the value that we can out of this asset by selling our commodity, by selling lithium and spodumene into a buoyant market. The project, where is it? Mount Ida is located in the middle of the eastern gold fields. It's 230 kilometres northwest of Kalgoorlie. We have excellent access to infrastructure such as roads and ports. We also have a rail line down to Esperance. You're going to be moving a product which is a 6% lithium spodumene um, concentrate, that concentrate. Regardless of, what the, uh, regardless of what the future asset price is for lithium, we think it's going to be from somewhere between two and $10,000 a ton, whatever, whatever number you want to use it in there between. But we'll be able to get our product onto a boat for about $70 a ton from where we're sitting. We have a camp on site. Uh, there is existing living infrastructure there. We do have access to our own airstrip, which is five kilometres down the road, which is a great advantage. We don't have to build one. Uh, we're located on ground and mining leases. I'm going to repeat this five times. This is such an enormous advantage in Western Australia. It's, a, it's an area that's been mined since 1900. It's disturbed. By us going in there, we're actually going to be making it a better place. Significant lifting and footprint. The area itself has never been explored for lithium before. As I said, we've picked up 150 square kilometres of tenements in the area. And we believe there's massive upside over the next six to 12 months in our, once we focus on our regional exploration, which at the moment we haven't, we haven't even touched. We've just been uh, really focusing on the central Mount Ida resource itself. This part to work. Sorry, Eddie, I'm going to put this up. Lithium market buoyancy. Again, just going back to speed to market, it's just, it's really the mantra for Red Dirt is because we've been so aggressive over the last 12 months, we're about to release our first maiden resource estimate. The demand fundamentals for lithium underpinned by government policy and this global effort to decarbonize across the entire world. Everybody is out there trying to secure exposure in product. There is a massive amount of um, uh, converter capacity installed in China, uh, predominantly China. Uh, then you have some in Korea. There's a lot of people we've been talking to in Europe who are trying to and, and potentially want to install converter capacity. But none of them, or not none of them, not none of them that's, a, that's a lie, a lot of them are still looking for additional spodumene supply, the primary product to put in the front end. And Red Dirt is going to be well-placed to be able to supply that market. Since we started marketing our product probably three months ago, uh, we've had a massive amount of inbound interest in the company. We're currently talking to four off-takers, and uh, we think that the amount of interest is there, there's, a, there's going to be a very good outcome for us with regards to getting off tech signed up before we get to production. Corporate overview, uh, I think really focused on the people here. Uh, recently, our chairman, Alex Hewlett, was the founding chairman uh, of Red Dirt Metals, did a fantastic job and together with James Crozer setting up, setting up the company, uh, has stepped down. We've had David Flanagan uh, join as executive uh, chairman. David, I guess, doesn't need a lot of introduction. Most people here would know who David is. David set up Atlas Iron. He also is the chairman of Battery Minerals and on the board of Northern Star and Macca. David's got an, an excellent network in Western Australia, as would you believe. He's built five mines. I've built two myself. So the executive team really has the capacity to bring uh, projects from exploration into production. That's the critical key. We've also had another key addition to our board this year, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Gower. He, Gower spent the last 14 years of his life uh, selling everything from cashew nuts to lithium, most importantly at Mitsui. 
Gower has spent the last seven years of his life negotiating and being directly involved in selling and purchasing and setting up off-take contracts for lithium. Having his knowledge and his ability to put yourself in front of a serious off-taker and somebody we know is going to be able to sustain a forward-going purchase of our product over the coming five to 10, 20 years, whatever it may be, is a great advantage for us. It's a short, it gives you the security that you know you're talking to the right people. And Gower, since joining us, has, has facilitated that inbound interest into red dirt. And it's been incredible to see how much interest there actually is in acquiring our product. Tim Manners, CFO of Remelius Resources, uh, and Steve Wood and Nader, sorry, Steve Wood is our, is our co-sec. We do have fantastic team in place. We do have, we've been able to set up a geological team on site now. We have four geologists on site. We have, when I started in 12 to 18 months ago, there was myself and one geologist. We're now about 30 people in, in the business. We've raised 30 odd million dollars since inception. We still have $19 million in cash. We are spending at a, at a hell of a rate, uh, but most of that money is going to the ground. We've just had five rigs going flat out at Mount Ida since probably the start of the year. We've just dropped down to two rigs as our mineral resource estimation is imminent. Our drill out of that, uh, the, of that resource is now completed and we're moving into regional exploration phase. Mount Ida, New Lithium Province. Initial, as I just said, initial resource drilling is now completed. I'm not sure if that, yeah, that works. The central, just to give you an idea of exactly how big their land package is, that's, that's where Mount Ida sits in the middle. Those are the three pegmatites sites we've currently drilled out, which will make up part of the initial resource estimate. The, the rest of the land package sort of runs on the western and eastern limb of what you, eastern limb of what you see is this large, it's a massive intrusive granite, granitic complex. This is the source of all the pregnant lithium fluids, which are then pumped out into these mafic units into what we call, uh, it's a Goldilocks zone. Every lithium asset in Western Australia or spodumene assets in Western Australia, besides the green bushes, which is an anomaly for more reasons than one, sit within zero to five kilometers of a large intrusive wet granite body. We have 22 kilometers of, or 22 to 25 kilometers there or thereabouts of strike length of that contact zone on our assets. That's why we think Mount Ida could potentially produce 10, 20, 30 times the amount of lithium we've currently drilled off. We're confident in the fact that we now have a critical mass drilled off to be able to produce, to be able to take the company to the production phase. We will be releasing our resource in the next four weeks, hopefully. That resource will be big enough for us to then wrap our wrap some economics around it, some physicals around it, and give you an idea of exactly how big that project is going to be. We're aggressively exploring the rest of this the rest of this tenement package. As I said before, we've got 40,000 meters planned until the end of the year. And we've got 45 targets, which has been recently developed from a geochemical program that ran over the, ran over the rest of the asset. Like I said before, there's been no, no exploration for um, lithium on the Mount Ida asset since, since, um, since inception. It's only been a gold and copper asset. And so we're put, pretty much doing our exploration back to front. We knew we had a lithium pegmatite at the central Mount Ida zone, which is the sister Sam pegmatite. And since then, we've just been basically been stepping out from that asset without any regional target generation completed before we've just completed this last geochemical survey. The sister sand pigmentite, this is the pigmentite that's gonna underpin the entire resource. It's an exceptional pigmentite dike, LCT pigmentite. The spodumene grades in this pigmentite are up over 2% in places. The thickness is 25 to 35 meters. It's one continuous slab starts from about 30 to 40 meters below surface. There is a depletion zone with all the pigment sites in Western Australia, we find most of them anyway, finding that the depletion zone lithium is very mobile once it starts to weather. We get into our pigment site at about 30 to 40 meters below surface where we think the grades are going to be economic and we can actually recover the spodumene from it. The sister sand pigment site plunges down, open still at 600 meters below surface. If you have a look at some of the results there, you're getting 25 meters at at 2%, you're getting 35 meters one and a half percent, high spodumene contents, good metallurgy. The thickness, just to try and give you an idea, if you walk outside today and have a look at a seven story building, that's pretty much how thick the pegmatite here at, at Mount Ida is. It gives you the flexibility to mine that both from underground open pit in different manners, whilst reducing the amount of dilution you get when you're putting it through a plant. 
We have no internal waste um, and our exploration efforts from now on are going to be focusing on finding a repeat of the SISTAM pegma site on the rest of our expansive ground package. Zones of multiple pegma sites, as I said before, the sister SAM is that one there. So it's one of the one of the main pegma sites that can form basically the major part of our resource assessment. What you're looking at here is a is a surface projection of the of the wireframe pegma type bodies. There's three of them to date that will form the main part of our initial resource. The Timonian sister SAM will probably form sort of 60 to 70 percent of that. Um, the Sparrow project has only been recently drilled. We only discovered that about three months ago. And as I said, again, we've only been doing this for about 11 months. We started drilling in November of, uh, of 2021. Some, um, some of the results have you seen before, even in the even in the, in the Timoni pigment site, 15 meters of 1.5, 14.2, 1.3, and 13 meters at above a percent, basically will lend themselves to both underground and open pit uh, mining uh, methods. Good thick pegmatites with lots of lithium units per vertical meter in each of the uh, each of the assets. Moving on. Oops, sorry. How do I go back there? Sorry, I've jumped two slides there. Lithium. Thank you. Yeah, lithium project timeline, as I said, started in September of 2021. There was the discovery through basically looking at the data that was passed on to us that it was, it was lithium bearing pegmatites of Mount Ida. Maiden drill program commenced in October, November of that year. IDD002, discovery hole, 21.7 meters at 2.1%. That really gave us the impetus to say, okay, right now we've got something that's serious. This is going to be a very, very important spodium marine bearing asset in Western Australia. Capital raised, raised 22 million. We have spent to date around about $10 million into this asset. Metallurgical study, we did a scoping study on that initial hole that we pulled out. It was fantastic results. 52% of that returned to a DMS concentrate in the 3.35 millimeter product. And another 22% of that material was recovered in a flotation circuit. We are currently running our pre-feasibility level metallurgical studies. We've got about a ton of material in the lab at the moment. What that'll do is give us the uh, basically a representative recovery over the global ore body before we go in and put some metrics around it later in the year. We're doing a mining study once the resources out and that'll give some, provide some physicals. People can actually start to plug in some economic numbers and get a better feel for what the project will produce in the future. Made mineral resource coming out in a couple of weeks time. Commencement of pre-feasibility study in quarter four of this year. As I said before, offtake is one of the key milestones for red dirt metals. That's in, key, that's in discussion. We have four people lined up for that at the moment and those discussions are well and truly advanced. Bankable feasibility and some and a financial investment decision next year. Sorry, 2024. Unlocking resources for a greener future. I have to reiterate these five points. Speed to market. Because of where we are on a ground of mining lease in Western Australia, the aggressive nature of the of the exploration and our and our um and our access to, to ports and infrastructure, we're going to get to market quicker than anybody else. We have a strong balance sheet. And we have a team in place that can actually do the mining projects in Western Australia. Thank you very much for your time. Matthew Boy's Red Dirt, a fantastic version outing there, sir. Well done. Looking forward to seeing you back in the years to come. Now, we all know there's not enough lithium. We keep hearing it. As you observed, um, Eddie, God knows what the result will be as the result for the need of all these uh, new world metals in the EV market. One thing for sure, with examples like uh, Eddie showed us with Pilbara, there's a lot of upside for us as investors as that demand grows. And we know that Europe has the fastest growing market for EVs and European Metals believes that their project the Sinovitz project is perfectly poised to take advantage of that market. Keith Coglin is joining us up on stage. He's executive chairman. And Keith, can I just say that um, given the depth of passion in your team for the Dockers, I'm amazed that you not, have not temporarily in this month of September changed the colour of your logo, sir. Uh, no, Chrissy, and we won't be doing that in any hurry. I don't think you'd change horses midstream. Okay. And uh, <laughs> Peter's, Peter's love of the Dockers is... Solely Peter's love. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, great to be here again. Thanks to the organisers for putting this together. I was reflecting just a little while ago. We bought this project uh, in 2014, so we've been we've been coming to these sort of presentations for quite a while. 
and it's changed a lot. You know, we used to have to explain what lithium was, talk about electric cars and, and you know, what the, the forecast demand was and all that sort of thing. And fair to say, we got it horribly wrong. We, we grossly underestimated the demand for electric cars, the penetration rates of electric cars, and uh, the number of electric cars we see on the roads these days is well above anyone's predictions from a few years ago and, and, and the, the cars we're going to see over the next few years. In fact, there's so many electric cars around now and, and into the short term future pretty soon, we'll stop calling them electric cars and just call them cars. And nowhere is that more evident than in Europe where we're operating. So let me just tell you a little about the project itself. So we're developing the largest hard rock lithium project in Europe. And as you will see, if you've read a lot of lithium commentary over the last few weeks, people like Piedmont Lithium, Chris Allison, Pilbara, et cetera, they all say it's all about the resource. You have to control the resource. That's where the automakers are going. Automakers need to secure supply. Battery makers need to secure supply. Owning the resource is an enormous tick. We're also developing a fully integrated project. That is, we're going right through to battery grade chemicals, lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, not producing a concentrate to sell to someone else who will make the profit on the conversion. The project is fully funded through to our final investment decision expected sometime next year. We've got a very, very strong partner in that project, a large Czech company, in fact, the Czech National Power Utility, partially owned by the Czech government. Uh, I'll talk about them a little more in, in the future. And the only other thing I really want to focus on this slide, if you look down the bottom right-hand side there, our uh, market cap at $134 million is less than one-tenth of our share of the NPV of this project. So we kind of think there might be a little upside there. So I won't, Eddie, talk about supply demand in gross terms, but I will just focus on Europe because this is a very important part of our business plan and our thematic. So nowhere in the world will the demand for lithium grow quicker than in Europe in the foreseeable future. And there's a couple of uh, indications of that on this slide. The European Union is all in. They are fully committed to an electric vehicle future. They're fully committed to building a battery industry and slowly, 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 they're coming to terms with the fact that they're gonna have to develop their own raw materials. So, so mining went out of vogue in Europe a few years ago. They outsourced their problem mainly to Africa, but you know, it's a global world now and they're coming to the realization they have to develop their own hard rock, uh, their own uh, battery metals projects where possible. Just come back from Europe, the biggest issue, as I'm sure you're all aware in Europe currently is uh, energy security, specifically gas from Russia, given what's happened in the Ukraine and the massive steps we're seeing throughout Europe to reduce their reliance on Russian gas. They don't want to rely on Russia for gas into the future, which makes sense. Similarly, Europe does not want to rely on China for its lithium. They've committed a trillion euros to the Green Deal, and lithium is a big part of that, obviously, and it would be bad business to commit that sort of money, that sort of commitment to any industry, and then rely on China or anywhere else in the world, but specifically China, for a large part of your supply. And that's very important to our thematic. Why is Europe all in? Well, these are the number of uh, electric vehicle sales across main markets of Europe in July. So 45 to 50% of every vehicle sold in July across these three main markets was some form of electric vehicle. Now, you know, living here in Australia, we could be forgiven for not understanding how big the uptake in electric vehicles is in other parts of the world. And that's because, you know, electric vehicles is an infrastructure play. You've got to roll out charging stations and what have you. Australia is a very big country with a very small population. And so that infrastructure spend is very expensive. And we have range anxiety. We all like driving, you know, big distances down south up to Broome or whatever. But none of that is the case in Europe. You know, the, the infrastructure on a per capita basis is much cheaper. It's being rolled out by governments and by the EU. There's no range anxiety. And so the uptake is greater. In Germany, you can get up to 6,000 euros to purchase your first electric vehicle. So in some cases that really, you know, that's more than half the cost of the vehicle. And that's why we're seeing this sort of uptake. Uh, I love this chart. So just this year on the left-hand side, these were the people producing uh, batteries in Europe, 
you know, your mainstream Korean, uh, Chinese companies, et cetera. And by 2030, it's changed a lot. So Tesla, just Tesla in Europe will need over 120 uh, gigawatt hours worth of lithium or about 120,000 tonnes of, of lithium carbonate equivalent. Tesla's numbers, their, their forecast is to build 20 million electric vehicles by 2030. So in order to do that, they will need 150% of all the lithium produced in the world last year. That's one company, or in our case, one region. So that's enough of supply and demand, Eddie. I won't even talk about this slide. I think everyone understands the concept of supply and demand in, in the battery metal space. I take your point, $90,000 a tonne for lithium carbonate seems uh, unsustainable, but the fact is it doesn't have to be anywhere near $90,000 a tonne for companies like ours to make a tremendous amount of money from this industry. Uh, I mentioned Sinovitz is the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. It, it accounts for more than 65% of all the known hard rock resources. This is important because the size of the deposit goes to long-term security of supply initially, but it also goes to helping us get the attention of the European Union, the various governments and the, the big players in this space in Europe. And it, it means that the project is far more likely to get the financial permitting support to go into production, which we believe it, it will do. This, this slide, it just gets busier and busier every time we upgrade it. These are the, the uh, battery factories built in construction or advanced planning across the region. The gold star in the middle is our project. So if you consider the journey of lithium currently from somewhere in Western Australia via China to Europe, compared with us putting it on a truck or a train and sending it 50 to 100 kilometers down the road, Clearly, we've got some significant advantages in that, both from a cost point of view, but also from an ESG point of view. And ESG is clearly becoming more and more important in all mining projects globally. We've got high quality infrastructure. This is a historic underground tin mine. So Sinovitz produced tin off and on for 600 years. Last production was when the wall came down back in 1998, uh, and the project's been shut in since then. Tin, incidentally, is a very important byproduct credit for us. And uh, you know, tin tin's a bit boring as a metal, but everything relies on tin in the new economy. You don't tin in solder. Electrons don't flow without tin. Your mobile phone doesn't work without tin. Electric cars can't can't charge without tin. So we're quite happy with this boring metal as our byproduct. It's worth about thirty to forty million dollars a year in byproduct credits in the early stages and upwards of 100 million towards the back end of the initial mining plan, uh, 100 million per year. I mentioned the ESG profile, it's very important. We commissioned an independent study December last year and on an optimized case, it showed Sinovets as um, potentially being one of the best lithium producing projects in the world from an ESG perspective. So. Permitting is very important everywhere, but particularly in Europe. We've, I'm sure we've all seen some of the high profile problems with permitting projects. Uh, the fact that we are re-entering an underground historic mine makes a very big difference. Uh, there are a number of other things there in terms of being able to use solar power for the majority of the project. Our partner, as I said, the Czech National Power Utility already produces more than enough solar power that our project will ever need. But there's a bunch of other factors here that, that help our ESG profile significantly. That study I mentioned focuses on three key issues. Um, firstly, you talk about global warming potential or what we used to call your CO2 footprint, carbon footprint, also on water usage and acidification. And the, the project stacks up very well on all three of these critical issues. I mentioned CHES, the CHES Group, the Czech National Power Utility, they're a publicly listed company. Their market cap is about 22 billion US. That slide's a little old. Uh, sorry, 22 billion euros. They're 70% owned by the Czech government. They're a fantastic partner for us. They historically mined coal, owned the 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 electricity grid throughout uh, throughout the Czech Republic. They've been moving away from coal as the whole region has for a number of years. They now own wind assets, solar assets, and, uh, and very soon lithium assets. They own all of the EV charging stations throughout the Czech Republic. 
and their job currently in the JV is to get all the permitting, government liaison, et cetera, all under control. They've got a, they've got a staff in country of 35,000 people and they've got whole departments dedicated to permitting. So we're feeling quite comfortable about that side of the business. The EIT, the, um, inst the European Institute of Innovation and Technology is a formal uh, EU body. They're the principal facilitator of the European Battery Alliance. And we have a formal agreement with them whereby they assist us in all aspects of the project, funding, uh, permitting, messaging, and all these sorts of things. Very, very handy to have them involved. Uh, just touching on the numbers again. So this, we updated our PFS in January of this year. We used 17,000 US dollars a tonne for lithium hydroxide. And as we've spoken about already, that number is, you know, 90 odd thousand today. So, you know, the hardest decision was what price to use. I saw a study come out just yesterday from a group in Germany using 22,500 a tonne, still well, well below what we're seeing in the spot price. Um, but at anywhere, anywhere between the 17,000 we used and the 90,000 that it is today, clearly the project um, makes a lot of money. Importantly, this business plan, producing 29 odd thousand tonnes per annum of battery grade hydroxide for 25 years uses less than 10% of the overall resource. That's how big this deposit is. So clearly we're doing a lot of work on studies to upgrade the production, get it from that 30 odd thousand tonnes per annum upward of 50. Uh, if we're able to do that, which we believe we can, it makes it a, a far more significant project from a global perspective. The next things for us to do, so towards the back end of this year, we'll be locking away offtake. We've deliberately been uh, been a little slow on offtake because the market just keeps getting better and better for us. We also definitely want to have a European solution to this. We want to see the entire value chain remain within Europe. Um, and, and in doing so, I think we'll get significantly more assistance out of the European central banks and out of the, uh, the, the EU themselves and the governments. So uh, permitting offtake and what have you towards the back end of this year, final investment decision about the middle of next year and um, and about uh, 18 months of construction thereafter before we're in production. The team gets bigger. Uh, there's a couple of additions to this over the next uh, week or two, but this is our this is our European metals team. As I say, our partner in country has 35,000 of their own employees. You know, we the, the, the team will evolve. There'll be a lot of uh, a, a lot of expats, a lot of people out of this part of the world with with specific lithium experience, but there'll also be uh, a large flavour of German and and Czech engineering and um, and expertise from that point of view. Uh, I've got forty seconds to go. Have I, Chrissy? Look at that for timing. Um, in summary. We have the largest hard rock lithium deposit in a part of the world in which the demand for lithium will grow quicker than anywhere else in the world. Um, we're fully funded through our final investment decision, and we're currently trading at about one tenth of our share of the after tax MPV. If you'd like to discuss that any further, please come and see me in the booth. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Keith. I would never suggest that you change your fantastic logo. It is a well-defined design, a well-defined logo. I was just thinking about you know, the term purple patch, though. We're going to have a bit of an AFL role here today, purple patch and what it means. I just had a quick look. Do you know that um, the name purple comes from the poffra, which was a shellfish, Mr. Morrow? A little tiny fat shellfish. They used to squeeze all the dye out of it, very hard to get a hold of, very rare. They used to put it into the robes of the emperors and the judges. That's my way our dockers chose the colour purple. At least it made them think like they were winners before they even got out there on the field. We're going to move from lithium to one of the rarest of minerals, platinum. It's a beautiful mineral. I've got a little bit of it on my finger here. It's much sought after in a number of industrial uses. And you know the concentration of this mineral is actually higher on the moon and on meteorites than it is here on Earth. Welcome up this fellow up here to stage to um, tell you a little bit more about the opportunities with platinum for your portfolio. Um, most often, platinum is mined as a byproduct around the world, but that's going to change uh, in WA's Midwest. The Murchison uh, is the region that's going to change that. And to tell us about the full potential of podium minerals, will you welcome this fellow, please? Ladies and gentlemen, Podium Minerals MD and CEO, Mr. Sam Rodder. 
Perfect. Thanks, thanks, Chrissy, and, and and thanks for vertical events and everyone who's speaking before me. Uh, plenty of lithium, so this is a, a bit of a change of pace. And and unfortunately, it's it's the only PGM and, and platinum group metal um, speaker today. But I'm pretty pleased around what we're seeing in WA specifically and in Australia moving forward. We've got a huge opportunity to actually grow uh, grow together with some of our uh, late exploration companies here. And, and some of them would be familiar to people in this room, such as, such as Chalice. But more importantly, this is, this is a podium story. Um, Eddie, I did take note around supply and demand and, and I was acutely aware that you, you missed a fair bit of BGM. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a couple of little intros in, in through it. So, so bear with me. <clears throat> Rightio, just before I get into the PGM, there are four key things I'll touch base on. We've got a exciting resource up at uh, Parks Reef. Uh, it's just west of Kew, uh, top of the Midwest, as Chrissy highlighted earlier. A great location with a number of operating mines, iron ore around us, West Gold. I see Australian vanadiums nearby us. Uh, we've got clear and clean cut titles. Uh, we've got mining leases and a native title agreement in place. The resource I'll speak about is what excites me and what attracted me to Podium on the 1st of January this year. And, and I'll talk around what that means for our project and why we've selected a, a development-based team rather than a future, future explorer team. Talk about the market a little bit because it's, it's pretty important. Um, and when we think about PGMs, you're sitting there going, what do PGMs play in the, in the new world metals? I'll cover that as well. It's not, it's not just in the battery electric, but PGMs and our suite of metals really is one of the truest sources of, of green metals in today's technology and in future technologies moving forward. <clears throat> so quick snapshot, PGMs is a takeaway. People are very familiar with, with platinum. We've seen the prestige, we've seen the jewellery, which Chrissy spoke to. The Queen's 75th anniversary was a platinum anniversary. Uh, but what, what we're not seeing publicly is those other five PGM elements. Palladium. So palladium, high value, high use in auto catalysts, uh, particularly for petrol powered vehicles. And, and people have different views around how they wind out, but they are critical along with platinum around moving, removing noxious gases moving forward. So right here, right now, today, they're playing a significant part in decarbonising our world. And then we've got the rarer platinum group metals. We've got rhodium, iridium, we've got ruthenium and osmium. So you won't hear a lot about those moving forward. I think similar to the rare earths with 17 minerals. If your takeaway is PGMs is platinum based, there's six very rare high value metals with, uh, with critical components within them um, for electrolysis, chemical production and uh, advanced technology, then that's, that's the bulk of what you need to know around PGMs moving forward. So for us, I've covered a fair, a fair part of that. As I said, auto catalyst is today, here and now in petrol and diesel powered vehicles. The exciting element for me and the attraction for me with PGMs moving forward is very much around the hydrogen economy. So green hydrogen, particularly in, uh, in servicing a decarbonised uh, world moving forward, but also around hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And whilst they're not leading, you know, leading the market and they don't have the same salesmanship around uh, what Elon Musk and Tesla have got, Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are absolutely pushing ahead in longer distance, uh, light vehicle trucks, heavy vehicle trucks, uh, trialled in trains, et cetera. So for vehicles and particularly for green vehicles moving forward, those looking for range, um, which, which a couple of the speakers spoke about earlier, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles is absolutely a major component to be considered as part of the decarbonised mix moving forward. And PGMs are critical in the, in the electrolyzers of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles moving forward. So where are they? From a demand point of view, PGMs sit on the critical minerals list across pretty much every jurisdiction in the world. Australia, US, EU, Japan, India. When we look at the colored, colored blue pieces of where PGMs come from, 
really only North America tick that box. So we've got Australia, Europe, Japan and India all looking to add PGMs or to source responsibly PGMs into their market moving forward. 80, 80 plus percent of the global supply comes from South Africa and Russia. So Russia um, has already had sanctions applied to it around some of their larger amounts of palladium into the market. And what we're seeing with South Africa, which really does have a, a long tradition in that PGM and platinum market, they're seeing challenges around power supply, geopolitical instability. They're seeing increases in costs with some of the labour uh, union discussions, as well as they're seeing depth in their mine and a decline in their grade. So the world is really looking for that new jurisdiction and Australia is well placed in it moving forward. I won't spend much on this. Uh, the pack will be listed or is listed on the ASX and our website. I do encourage people to jump in and continue to look for that demand point of view. So Parks Reef, absolutely fundamental to podium. Uh, as I said, 80 k's west of Mika Thara, about 40 odd kilometres sort of north northwest of Kew. Uh, existing mining leases, native title agreements. We have a 15 kilometre long ore body. Now you'll see some of the exploration targets and, and we've seen some of them this morning, which have great pictures with geomagnetics and geo surveys and prospective exploration. Ours is 15 kilometres proven with drill holes. 300 300 drill holes over the last four years since listing in early 2018. So the maps we'll show you moving forward is a proven resource. We've got three holes, which we punched in late last year and, and early this year, down to 500 metres depth. They hit target bang on exactly where we wanted, uh, 10 kilometres apart from the further east and the further west one. And, and uh, we had our chairman's hole in the middle, which luckily for him did hit target as, as well. Um, but all three of those show what continuity of, continuity of our ore body really looks like. Here it is. As I said, on many other maps, the coloured zones up there are very much a sort of geophysics. This is actually a geological model are taken with real data, real intersections, metre by metre, grade by grade across our ore body. 15 kilometres long, hard to put into perspective um, when you sit here and, you know, on a single slide. But the reality is when you look at different open pit and underground operating mines in Australia, there's not too many which have an operating strike length of greater than two and a half, three kilometres. So we have the ability to host, you know, probably not one long narrow mine, it's going to be five or six different exploration, development and operating projects in the one location. So the ability to develop uh, fixed infrastructure to service a number of years and a number of mining options is pretty, pretty exciting for us. So from a numbers point of view, we do have an existing resource. We've got what we call a five element PGM. Four of them are the true PGMs, uh, platinum, palladium, rhodium, iridium. And we also include gold in it in the Australian environment. 52 odd million tonnes, 3 million ounces existing in resource, drilled down to 100 metres and, and with about 90 plus 90% 90 drill success in hitting, in hitting that uh, moving forward. The team we've brought on board is absolutely development focused. The people we've selected in the last couple of years have all operated mines, uh, done in-house studies, have done development and have had success throughout their last 20 to 40 years um, in, in the Australian uh, mining, uh, mining space. I don't touch too much on it, but we've got pretty handy byproducts too, copper, nickel and cobalt. All three of them in their own right would, uh, would canvas enough attention at a, at a New World Medals conference. So what does it look like? It's funny, when I look at some of the geology maps across uh, some of our different explorers, complexity looks great from a presentation point of view. From a mining engineer point of view, which I am, seeing simplicity is, is exciting. So when it comes to extracting and doing it economically and do it sustainably and minimising dilution and optimising grade, the simpler the geological ore body and the simpler the geology, the better it is for mining and the better it is for mining economics and better it is for grade through to the progressive plant moving forward. 
So high, high drill success. We've had strong conversion uh, to ounces over those last three or four years, our resource growth cost is relatively small compared to other precious metal players and or PGM players. You know, to date, we're, we're averaging under $2 per ounce added since, since 2018. I sat at uh, Diggers and Dealers a couple of years ago listening to uh, Jay Klein from Evolution saying they're targeting $50 per ounce added gold. We can, we've been able to prove we can do it at, you know, what's that? Five percent of what they're planning for. So that's the love of a consistent ore body. Now we have high grade zones as well. So the pleasing thing for us is we already think we've got a pretty solid resource, particularly compared to our peers and some of our global peers in the PGM market. But within our existing ore body, we do have a couple of high grade zones. One particularly closer to the hanging wall at just over two grams per ton, and that's 12 million, 12 million tons. Um, but we also have a another four to five meter ore body width within our average average width of 15 which carries high rhodium and high iridium for those which are coming across rhodium rhodium's worth uh give or take fourteen thousand us dollars per ounce so high use high value so where are the team focused now it's around mining strategy it's around processing strategy and it's what do we want to do with this project moving forward Mining, we've got options, we're shallow, we're near surface, we've got the ability to, to uh, open cut straight into, straight into ore um, pretty early on at that stage, and then transition to underground. So we've got plenty of options, which we'll take internally and study in the next couple of months to really narrow our focus moving forward. From a processing space, and this is, this is where the challenges and the opportunities come, we've got oxide ore close to the surface, Surface. We've got sulphide ore at depth. We have done a number of metallurgical tests around PGM flotation to develop a concentrate. And in parallel, we've done some hydromet work with atmospheric leach, which can target both oxides and sulphides to enable us to have a higher grade PGM product uh, targeting PGM refineries rather than a route through to predominantly Asian based smelters with high logistics cost, either from truck or, or shipping moving forward. So they're well progressed. We're expecting to get the market in Q4 to update the market around what those results and those recoveries look like. Moving forward, I won't spend much on this. Absolutely come and get us at the booth, um, but we are marching towards scoping study or what we would consider scoping study level and working towards a PFS towards the end of 2023 uh, for the market to inform some of the numbers and the production rates and economics moving forward. I won't spend much on this other than to highlight rhodium, small size in grams per tonne, high value, and that is just straight the value of metal. From a demand point of view, the global supply of rhodium is less than 30 tonnes. So consider pretty much the smallest single mining truck you've got, the world supply of rhodium would fit in the back of one of those small dump trucks. And iridium is seven, is seven tonnes for our annual, annual production. So we're really hitting the market in rare metals. Quick snapshot of the team, recent capital raise, we're well funded through, through the studies at the moment with 6 million cash in the bank. We've got an experienced development focused board, um, an executive team covering geology, mining, engineering, processing, finance, PGMs um, and projects. So absolutely the right mix to progress this as soon as practical. And just to close out, Chrissy, absolutely Australia can be globally significant in this space, particularly working together with our peers, but with Podium absolutely leading and supporting from the front in this space. We've got the right skills, we've got the right focus around pathway to production and a great platform for development moving forward in what we think are critical green metals moving forward. So thanks, Chrissy, and thanks all. Mitch Thomas is coming up to join us. He is actually talking about um, new electric vehicles. Mitch has got a new electric vehicle, don't you? It's parked downstairs. He might tell you about that. Came a bit earlier than he expected. But Mitch is up here in his capacity as the newly appointed CFO of Blackstone Minerals. He's recently joined them from Rio Tinto, where he was their CFO.
Premature is working in LA, California. Would you welcome him and let's learn about Blackstone's future plans. Thanks very much, Chrissy. Uh, I think I told you not to mention that, but uh, anyway, very topical in our household at the moment. So uh, again, just good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at New World Medals and also to, to represent uh, on behalf of the Blackstone team. And we have a few members at the back. Uh, look, I, I, it's uh, for those that are unfamiliar with our company, our vision is to build a world-class nickel mining and refining center in Vietnam and be one of the world's greenest nickel producers. This one. There we go. Uh, we'll also be uploading these slides, so I recommend taking your time to review. So here's an outline of our topics today. So we'll start with an overview of the company. Uh, we'll then jump into the market and talk about our position within it. I will also give an update on our main project in Vietnam and our DFS studies. And we'll finish off with a bit on partnerships and also touch on the Inflation Reduction Act. So getting into it, look, our main mine, our main project is the Banfuk Nickel Mine or Takpar project in Vietnam. So Banfuk was an operating mine between 2013 and 2016, uh, but then entered uh, care and maintenance when nickel prices hit about $9,000 a ton, uh, which I think is all time lows, uh, at least in the last 20 years. Uh, in 2019, we acquired the operating entity, which included the mineral concession, uh, the existing mine, camp, infrastructure, and also a transfer of IP and an excellent team, uh, many of whom remain part of the Blackstone team today. Since then, we drilled over 100,000 metres and added 485,000 tonnes of nickel, uh, with many more targets to be tested in what is clearly a uh, substantial mineral district. So we've completed a pre feasibility and are advancing a definitive feasibility study and associated uh, pilot plan test work is taking place here in WA at ALS Labs, uh, but we also have a pilot plant in, in Vietnam at site. So I guess onto the slide and, and why do we feel our project is an important, has an important role to play in the global energy transition? So one, look, our project is an integrated mine and refinery producing about 80,000 tonnes per annum of battery precursor or PCAM. Uh, that will use low cost hydroelectric power from the grid. And to highlight our uh, green credentials, and we have a dot point here, a recently completed life cycle analysis by MinViro demonstrates that we will have the lowest carbon footprint amongst our peers. Uh, the second point, and I won't dwell on this too much, is that I'm sure most of the audience are aware that there's a looming supply gap. Uh, this decade is projected uh, for nickel given demand growth. And I guess the, the Blackstone angle here is that we feel the market will be even shorter for high ESG nickel, uh, given government policy and community demand for more sustainable production. Uh, the third point is that, look, we're very excited to have our project in Vietnam. Uh, we see it as a vibrant business hub, especially in the EV space with companies like VinFast and, and also technology providers from, from South Korea are really making their mark and, and spending big in country. And just before I move on from this slide, look, just for orientation, so our project is based west of Hanoi, which is the capital of Vietnam, in a province called Son La, which is largely a farming area, and that resides about 100 kilometres again uh, west of Hanoi. So just quickly on this side, look, I think the key point is, is that we're well funded at the moment, so we had 34 million at 30 June. Uh, and I'll provide more detail on, on, I guess, where we're allocating that funding and also the, the progress with our DFS in a couple of slides. So corporate overview, look, here's a, a bit of detail on our board of directors, and I'll summarise it by just saying they share a lot of experience across mining, mineral development, uh, geology, corporate governance, and cathode active uh, material technology. Okay, so we'll touch on a bit more about Vietnam. So the photo you see here to the right is our existing concentrator on site, which has a capacity of 450,000 tonnes per annum. It's currently operational as part of flotation test work in support of our DFS. And look, given the fact that we're, you know, in a sense operating in country and also the team that we have in, you know, supporting our, our site, we are strong advocates for Vietnam as an investment destination. Uh, other international companies, uh, we feel, feel the same as foreign direct investment uh, between the year 2000 and 2020 increased more than tenfold to reach $16 billion. 
And, and why is this the case? Look, uh, from our perspective, we feel the government is very supportive of bringing capital and technology into the country uh, to support development. And additionally, and, and very important from a mining perspective, uh, the costs of doing business are very competitive. So in terms of labour, electricity, and execution of capital projects, uh, Vietnam uh, fares very well. A very important point for our project is that the grid in the north of the country is primarily backed by hydro, which is one of the key reasons why an integrated uh, nickel mine and refinery makes so much sense. Uh, the last point I have here is to say that, look, uh, we have great uh, we have a great confidence in our ability to operate in country, given our team and experience, and also the previous owner of the Banfoot Nickel Mine. And so for reference, the previous owner invested 136 million in capital and generated 213 million US of revenue over three years of operation, again, before the uh, untimely drop in nickel prices. Um, but the key point for our company is that we're not starting from, from scratch and uh, we have a solid base to work from. So the market, look, the chart on the left is, is generally well understood for those following, I guess, our industry. Um, but what this chart, I think, in particular makes it more interesting is it shows that nickel demand for batteries is what is accelerating overall demand. And it's this segment of demand that we will supply into, and we will have a particular focus on markets demanding high ESG nickel, uh, including Europe, North America, Australia, etc. And to this point, uh, look, the chart on the right is based on recent life cycle analysis completed by Minviro, who performed similar studies for, for Tesla, for Pilbara and, and Vulcan, among others. And as you can see, our project was assessed to have the lowest uh, emissions for precursor cathode active material production in the industry. Uh, this is due to a number of factors, including our energy source, flow sheet design, technology, low strip ratio, uh, and proximity to market. And look, the final point is to say is that we're very proud of the 9.8 kilograms of carbon per tonne of precursor, uh, but we have plans and ambitions to reduce it even further. And I'll touch on that in a few more slides. Look, so here's a quick project overview. So look, if we start with our resource, and this is 485,000 tonnes of nickel in situ, uh, the majority is low grade at 0.4% nickel, uh, but that's equivalent to say BHP's Mount Keith and other large disseminated uh, sulfide resources. Mitigating grade, look, we have a low strip ratio. Now we have access to green and, and low cost energy and a highly productive and cost efficient labor market in country. Our concentrator is designed at 8 million tons per annum, uh, which will produce about 200,000 tons of nickel concentrate. The hydromet refinery is designed to receive 400,000 tonnes per annum of concentrate. So that will mean a 50-50 mix of own feed from our own concentrator and also external sources uh, being interests we own and or commercial interests. Uh, the final point I'll note on this slide is that our DFS study is underway and that's supported by wood. And as part of that, we're also looking at staging options to reduce upfront capital and generate cash flow earlier. Uh, so this is really an extension, but it illustrates that feed from our concentrator will be from a mix of disseminated and massive sulfide resources uh, from, from our project vicinity. Uh, we hope to add more options, and I see we've got one of our geologists uh, in the room uh, through regional exploration, as we have a number of targets. Uh, a key, so moving on to our refinery, look, a key attribute of our flow sheet is that the design of our refinery is largely feed agnostic. Uh, so what this means is that we'll be able to feed third-party concentrate, MHP, nickel mat, and other external feedstock, uh, including black mass, which you know just gives us enormous optionality with how we operate and fill our mill. Uh, so look, we released the market an update on our studies in, in early August. And so amongst a number of key points, and I recommend you, you take a look if you're interested, uh, we provided updates on stage development options, as mentioned, um, but also a reduction to non-critical spend uh, given market volatility at the moment. So look, the left uh, side of this slide is a comparison of our upstream business being overlaid against peer group operations. Look, as can be seen, we'll be first to second quartile uh, in terms of all in operating costs, which is, gives us confidence that we have uh, ability to mitigate nickel um, market volatility. And, and as touched on earlier, look, we, we are low grade, 
um, but we feel that's offset uh, by our scale, low strip, and the low cost operating environment in Vietnam. Uh, the right hand side is an extension of the, the LCA results discussed, but demonstrates a pathway to reduce our emissions even further to 6.3 kilograms of carbon per tonne of precursor. And you can see that the biggest, I guess, uh, opportunity there is the hydro PPA. And that's something that we feel very optimistic about achieving. And for reference, uh, our current camp and operations on site are powered by hydro from the grid. So resources, look, I will not go into too much detail here, but want to highlight that we are sitting on a mineral district of, with plenty of targets that remain untested. And I did say this earlier, but since acquiring the mineral resource three years ago, we drilled over 100,000 metres and added 485,000 tonnes of nickel resources, and that's before consideration of byproduct credits. And so to put our resource into perspective, here we include a few similar ore bodies and, and companies, I guess, within our peer group. And so the, the comparison is between reported nickel tonnes from nickel sulphide peers uh, versus market cap. And look, you can make your own comparisons, but we feel that we compare favourably given our nickel inventory, ESG credentials, and low cost operating environment in Vietnam. Uh, this was mentioned by Chris before, but the US Inflation Reduction Act is extremely topical at the moment. So it's worth saying that look, we feel the intent of the act is, is extremely beneficial to the industry as we need to do more to incentivize supply. And while Vietnam does not have a free trade agreement with US, we feel that our strategy is well-placed with a flow sheet that is ex-China and, and also a feedstock sourcing strategy that, that we can blend toward free trade agreement countries. Uh, we also retain options to stage our refinery to include a North American facility uh, should we choose. And so look, fair to say there's a lot more to play out in this space. Uh, so we're watching the news closely. Uh, so second last slide, um, but a very important topic being partnerships and specifically our partnership with VIN ES. Uh, so we signed an MOU earlier this year concerning joint development objectives in Vietnam. And so we're very proud of partnering, partnering with an emerging uh, OEM powerhouse in the EV space. And the final comment here is that there's a lot more to come from us concerning partnerships uh, with VIN, ES and, and others. So ahead of time, uh, but to wrap up, look, the main themes that I wanted to cover here today were one, the resource. So we have nearly 500,000 tonnes of nickel sulphides in Vietnam, uh, plus equity positions, exploration upside, m and targets. And the point being is that we have a strong resource backing. Uh, the second point, integrated low emission operation. So we will produce from mine to battery precursor with extremely low carbon emissions reporting to our final product, making us the greenest nickel flow sheet um, as confirmed by third-party analysis uh, being from Minviro. The third point is partnerships. Look, these are progressing. Uh, we know the market is hanging out for more information. All I can give is confidence that we are progressing. Uh, additionally, debt sounding has shown great interest in our strategy and project design. Uh, last point, Vietnam, and, and def last but definitely not least, is that, look, we're very proud to call Vietnam our, our home for our project, and we're very confident that Vietnam will have a key role to play in global EV growth. So that's it. Thank you very much, and visit us at the booth if you want more, want more information. Rich, thanks so much for wrapping up our first session today, and you can go and talk to him about his Tesla, which he was expecting to come in about 12 months. He was one of those lucky, insanely lucky human beings who got it in was it two weeks or two months? About two months. Absolutely unheard of. So go and ask him what the heck it was that he did to manage to get his car nice and fast. We're going to have a break for half an hour. I know you're eager to get out there. And I'm absolutely blown away by the number of people that are out there in our exhibitors hall at the moment talking to our presenters already. We are jam-packed today. So go and make the most of it. Thank you, everyone.